As we're working our way through the Gospel of John, we now have arrived at chapter 12, and we'll look at the first 11 verses. John chapter 12, verses 1 through 11, will be our text this morning. John chapter 12, verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which was, had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment, of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? And now this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the, ba the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my bearing has she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Let's pray, as is our custom. We'll pray silently for just a minute. And then we'll look at these 11 verses. Father, we acknowledge our weakness and our ability to understand what John wrote. But you've given us the spirit to lead us to all truth. And so we call upon the Spirit of God now to teach us what you would have us to learn from this section of your Word. We have honored your Word by reading it. We're going to try to honor your Word by preaching from it and hearing from it. And now we ask you to help us in the name of Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Well, John chapter 12 begins a, a major transition in John's Gospel. It begins with the account of Jesus' final week, and it ends with the cross. Uh, the seven-day period that begins here is the greatest week of all history. The seven days of creation were, of course, of huge importance, but John takes care here in recording, uh, well, he took care of recording the first seven days of Jesus' ministry way back in John chapter 1, verses 19 through 51. But the exceeding importance of Jesus' final week can be seen in the fact that John devotes almost half of his gospel to it, an emphasis that we can see in the other gospels as well. So when we combine the gospels, we can arrange a, a rough timetable of Jesus' last days. On Saturday, he ate with Lazarus and his sisters. On Sunday, Jesus is going to enter triumphantly into Jerusalem. He returned to Jerusalem on Monday, cursing the barren fig tree along the way. On Tuesday, he did his last public preaching in Jerusalem, which ended with Jesus going to the Mount of Olives and giving what we know as his Olivet Discourse to his disciples. On Wednesday, he stayed again in Bethany, returning on Thursday to observe the Passover with his disciples. They celebrated the Lord's Supper, after which he was arrested. Uh, that night and that morning, Jesus was tried, convicted, and then crucified. Now, it's interesting to notice the difference between what John records as compared with the content of the other Gospels. While Matthew and Mark and Luke focus mainly on Jesus' public events, John writes about the private fellowship that Jesus enjoyed with his close circle of disciples. John seems to have really enjoyed Jesus' intimate affection, as you'll notice in John 13, 23, and his gospel dwells on the theme 
of fellowship with Christ. And we'll see that really through the end of this, this, this whole book. Now, Jesus had been staying away from Jerusalem until the time had come for his dramatic entry that we'll be talking about next week. But now, as the time drew near for him to go into Jerusalem for that final time, he returned back to Bethany. And as we read in verse 1, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. Now his coming was greeted with joy and thanksgiving for the recent event regarding Lazarus' resurrection. And to celebrate Jesus' return back to Bethany, they made him a supper. And Martha, being typically Martha, served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Now this banquet, if you can picture it in your mind, shows a, a, a different believers offering different kinds of ministry to the Lord. Martha, her gift was service, and she is serving the Lord, and she offered her service gladly. Risen Lazarus, he served as a witness to Jesus' saving power, and he also sat next to him at this feast, and Mary was known for her deep devotion to Jesus. And John tells us in verse 3, then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Now this verse records one of the most beautiful scenes in the life of Jesus. Mary stands out for her picture of loving devotion, and she shows us four features of devotion to Christ that we should all try to imitate. First of all, I want to point out that Mary's devotion was courageous. Now, you recall from chapter 11, it ended with ominous news from the religious leaders who let it be known that if any man knew where he were, speaking of Jesus, he should show it, that they might take him. So, if anybody failed to do that, they would likely be accused of an accessory alongside of Jesus. We put out the wanted poster. We put out the be on the lookout for this Jesus guy. And if you don't turn him in, you must be one with him and you're going to be guilty. And in spite of that hanging over their heads, Mary and the others openly welcomed Jesus for this meal. Now, as we learn, Lazarus was in particular danger since the rulers sought to eliminate him because he gave evidence of this miracle of raising from the dead. Still, again, in spite of all of that, these courageous disciples put their devotion to Christ ahead of their own safety and well-being. Second, Mary displayed costly devotion. She took a pound of ointment, a spikenard, very costly to anoint Jesus, verse 4 says. Now, this would have been a bottle of perfumed oil of the highest quality. Judas claimed later on that the value was 300 pence, denarii, it was, the, it was the common nomenclature for their money, which was roughly a year's wages for a working man, or tens of thousands of dollars in today's money. Very costly. This was expensive oil of the highest quality. Now, some commentators conclude that Mary and Martha and Lazarus must have been very wealthy to have this kind of oil hanging around their house. Now, if this is the case, then they set a good example of those of us who have financial means available to us today. One of the dangers of wealth, and by the way, we're all wealthy as Americans. Uh, you want to find poverty, go down to Haiti, you'll see what real poverty is. Or go over to Africa and see some of the poor nations there. We are very wealthy people. And one of the dangers of wealth is that it creates a desire for pleasure and it creates a desire for valuable things. We just had this huge lottery last week and, and people were interviewed. What would you do if you won the lottery? Well, I'd buy a house, and, and I'd buy an airplane, and I would buy this, and I would buy that, and I would travel. I would see this world. All pleasure and things is what these people talked about. 
Now, statistics show that rich people tend to give away smaller portions of their money than poorer people do. But Mary was not this way. If she could afford valuable things, she also didn't hesitate to give these rich things to Jesus. Whole year's wages just pouring out on his feet. But I think it's quite possible that Mary was not a wealthy person. This jar of oil may have been a family heirloom or some kind of unique treasure that she had somehow acquired. Whatever the case, her devotion was such that she delighted to offer her very best that she had to show her love for her master. Thinking nothing of herself, she found her great delight in giving her very best in order to bless Jesus. Let's think about that. Because Mary is challenging us regarding the price that we're willing to pay as disciples for Jesus. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. What is your most treasured possession? Think about that. What's your most treasured possession? For some people, it's their stock portfolio or their 401k that they're going to retire on. They think about it. They contribute to it. They can't wait to retire and take advantage of it. If that's the case, then one way you can put Jesus first is to give sacrificially from your treasured assets out of love for him. Maybe it's your lifestyle. Americans like the way they live. Then, then you should think about maybe giving up some of your recreation that you enjoy so much to do service in the church or to share the gospel with others. Maybe it's the standard of living that you provide for yourself and your family, which you would not be willing to give up if God called you to be a missionary or a pastor. It, 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 maybe it's the self-image that worldly acceptance gives you so that you'll not boldly identify yourself as a Christian. If I do that, they'll think I'm weird or something. Or I'm some kind of fanatic, and, and I don't want to be thought of like that. And that's something that you treasure. If so, you really need to examine your heart and recalculate the value of the Lord Jesus Christ drawing near to him in order to develop this costly devotion that Mary had shown us, has shown us this morning. There's a pastor and an author named F.B. Meyer. And he tells of an occasion when a preacher suggested that his hearers make a love offering to Jesus of something that was especially precious. Uh, we love to give costly gifts to each other. So why not make a costly gift, gift to Jesus? Uh, as the offering plate was passed around, jewels and other valuable items started to fill the little trays. But among them was something especially precious. There was an older woman who had given a note stating that her daughter had longed to go far away and be a missionary, but the mother had stood in her way because she didn't want to part with her precious daughter. Now, out of her love for Christ, she would not stand in her way any longer, but would offer her daughter up to Jesus to spread his gospel to the world. What a blessing it is when our awareness of the priceless love that Christ has set us free from our possessions and people and things. That's where Mary's at. Sometimes we have to let go of other things that we love to recognize just how precious Christ is to us. I'm going to go out on a limb and say he's not that precious to the average American Christian. They value things far more than Christ. He's just in addition to other stuff that they have. Oh, I have this and this and this, and I'm this and this, and people respect me, and so on and so forth. Oh, and by the way, I'm a Christian, and I get to go to heaven when I die. Just to tack on, just to add on. That was not the case with Mary. Third, I want to point out that Mary's devotion was a humble devotion. Now, the use of perfume was customary for special events. This was a time, folks, when bathing was not very frequent. 
and they lived in a very hot climate, which was conducive to body odor. I'm not sure they had uh, deodorant back then. I'm pretty sure that they didn't. And so when there was a gathering, the host would put a dab of oil on the head or the face of a guest. But Mary's devotion was so great that she did far more for Jesus. When Jesus reclined at this low table and his legs were extended outward, Mary proceeded not only to anoint Jesus' head, but also his feet. Now this is important to note because it was considered beneath people to wash the feet of others. Even slaves had rights, and one of their rights was they didn't have to touch the feet of their master's dirty, grimy feet. They didn't have to do that. But Mary didn't hesitate to wash and anoint Jesus' feet. She's giving up her rights before the Lord. There was nothing that he could ever ask her to do that she would not be willing to do. Touching his feet is her pledge to him that she will do whatever he asks and nothing is beneath her. Now, no doubt Mary's humility before Jesus came from her being aware of just who he was. If she had previously known his raising her brother Lazarus proved beyond uh, any doubt in her mind, this is the very Son of God. So for Mary, any service to Jesus was an honor and a pleasure, an occasion to worship him and show thanks for what he had done. She was like John the Baptist, who said, One mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. There in Luke chapter 3, 16. John meant that the most medial thing he might do for Jesus is not beneath him, but is actually above him. So glorious and so great is the Lord Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. In contrast, those who hold back from service to Christ, especially humble service, can only be those who have not understood at all the grace and the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Mary's devotion to Christ was more than humble. It was also, fourth, extravagant. It was extravagant. If the disciples who looked on were amazed when Mary anointed Jesus' feet, they were shocked when she wiped his feet with her hair. Let me tell you why. It was a scandalous thing for a woman back then to unbind her long hair in public. It was scandalous. A married woman could be divorced by her husband for this, and a single woman could be stoned, if you can imagine that. For a woman to let down her hair was to show intimacy openness, a fervent love, and it was done only in the privacy of the home and only in front of close family members. So, by not only unbinding her hair, but using it to wipe Jesus' feet, Mary expressed complete devotion, and nothing was being held back. She knew she was completely safe in his presence, and seeing him as her divine Lord, she wanted nothing to stand between him and her devotion to him. So this is a very important thing that's going on. Let's ask and answer the question, where in the world did Mary get this kind of devotion? The answer is found in every gospel account in which she is often sitting at Jesus' feet. Mary had turned her attention to Jesus had noted how different he was from everyone else. She had listened to his teaching, and she had given him her heart. Everyone who draws near to Jesus this way will also feel the kind of devotion for him that Mary displayed here. And those who are willing to not willing to show that kind of devotion, they don't know who they're dealing with. They can talk about Jesus, they can sing about Jesus, they can wave their hands about Jesus all they want, but they don't know him unless they have this kind of devotion. 
A, a, a similar example was a man who wanted to be a preacher, but he didn't have the gifts of the ministry. And he became a successful businessman instead, and he had earned a great deal of money. But he also wanted to do something for Jesus, and so he helped to open a mission hall in the center of a major city. After the mission closed on each Friday, he would show up in work clothes with a bucket of water and a brush, and on his knees he scrubbed the floors and washed the chairs. For quite a while, no one knew that he was doing this service. But on a Saturday, some men from his company went into the mission and they found their boss scrubbing. You shouldn't be doing this, they said to him. We'll do it ourselves or we'll pay someone else to do it. But he said, no, no, please let me do it. I want to do it for Jesus' sake. And that, folks, is exactly the point. For Jesus' sake. For Jesus' sake, whatever we can do, we also should do as we give out our devotion to him. Now, it sometimes says, and you've heard the saying before, no good deeds go unpunished. Now, whether that's true or not, it is true that genuine Christian devotion to Christ very seldom goes unchallenged. Even within churches. You just don't want to go overboard in this devotion to Christ. And people will challenge, well, they're a little bit fanatical, you know, and these people that show up for every service and put large amounts of money in the offering plate and, and, and you know, they, they, you don't want to go overboard. You know, just, there's that mentality in some church people. And Mary got challenged as well. Verses 4 and 5 we read, Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot. This is the same Judas that had hung out with Jesus for three years now. He had heard every one of his sermons. This is Simon's son, which should betray him. He shoots his mouth off. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Well, aren't you Mr. Holy Man, Judas? <laughs> Here's a challenge that's often made against the passionate devotion to Christ that's displayed here by Mary. It's better, many would argue, to do practical good works instead of spending time with the Lord. This spirit is very much alive today. Preachers hear complaints from their people about sermons that focus on the glories of Christ rather than the practical needs of our own lives. Oh yeah, we like to hear about Jesus once in a while, but give us something we can use. Teach us how to handle our finances better. Teach us how to, to treat our wives or our husbands so we can have better marriages. Teach us how to discipline our, our children because they're getting out of hand. Do something practical, preacher, but not so much of this talk about Jesus all the time. Whenever time or treasures are offered up simply to pay tribute to the glory of Jesus, some will complain that they could have been better used for the interest of men. Many people will echo Judas' opinion today, little realizing whom they're quoting. You know, you're doing all this stuff, but we could give some of this money to the poor. We need to help the homeless and so on and so forth. William Hendrickson, in his commentary, wrote, Judas is the type of man who has money on his mind all the while. He views everything from the aspect of pecuniary, that means financial, value. And there are church people, there are deacon boards, and that's all they talk about. The finances of the church, that's all they worry about. Very little talk about, does this honor Christ? When's the last time in a typical Southern Baptist slash charismatic church did the deacon board say, you know, does this music that we're performing with our gay looking worship leader and the drums and this and that, and this, this hoop nanny we're putting on, does that really glorify God? 
When's the last time did they talk about that instead of, well, we need money for this and, and we can't spend money on that and so on and so forth. That attitude is prevalent in modern day churches today. What a contrast is set forth here by Mary who viewed everything from the aspect of the glory of Christ. But there was a second objection to Mary's devotion to Christ, one that the former is often used to mask. John writes, this he said, speaking of Judas, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had to bag and bear what was put therein. Judas proves just how a hypocrite, a hypocrite can play the role of a disciple, even one trusted with high privileges. It's interesting that Jesus, who surely would have known that Jesus was a thief if John did, should nevertheless put Judas in charge of the money donated for the support of the disciples. Jesus was evidently more afraid of what Judas might do by stealing than by what Judas would do by betraying him, which he's going to do in a few short days. Mary's devotion offended Judas because his focus in religion was on getting all that he could out of it for himself. All he could think of when Mary poured that expensive oil on Jesus was the money that he might have taken for himself had it not been sold. I have a relationship with Jesus. What do I get out of it? We mentioned earlier, there will be people that will leave Baptist churches and walk out the door and they'll say, I don't get much out of that. Because they think it's all about them when it's all about Jesus. Not about them. Jesus broke her bottle to give all that she had to Jesus while Judas wanted to break into the money pouch and take from Jesus. We should be warned if there are signs of Judas' thinking in our own hearts. Do we come to church without any devotion to Jesus, only wanting to get some business contracts? If I go to the big church, I'll have more opportunity to intermingle with a whole lot more people so I can do my business with people. People do that, folks. They do that. Or the social benefits. We go to the prestigious church. This is where the rich people go because we want to be seen as a rich person, and that's what we get out of it. People do that, folks. Judas' greed led him to betray Jesus, making him one of the most hated names in all of history and ultimately costing him his soul. There are a lot of Judases in Baptist churches this very morning. Well, Jesus wasn't going to have it. He spoke out to defend Mary. Then said Jesus, I, I, I don't know what his tone of voice is. I'm going to imagine it was something like this. Let her alone. <laughs> Let her alone. Against the day of my bearing has she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Now, I don't think Jesus was speaking callously about the poor. All through the Gospels, his concern for mercy is very obvious. Instead, he's arguing that our concern for the problems of this world should not take the place of our worship of the Savior from heaven. That's what it's all about. At that moment, they were on the edge of history. Jesus wouldn't always be with them. Salvation was about to be secured for the world that Jesus had come into to save. And since Jesus was about to die on the cross, the very best use of this oil was anointing his body. In fact, it's probable that all throughout the events that are coming in the, in the next week, his arrest, his unjust trial, his cruel murder, his burial in the tomb, this fragrance of Mary's devotion could still be smelled on his body. I don't know that for sure, but I'm imagining that's the case. I don't think that you would spend that much money or this oil would be that much wor worth that much and it only lasted for 10 minutes. I think it was a lasting odor. Now this account 
of Jesus' anointing gives us a model of devotion and it answers a challenge of our devotion to him. But devotion to Jesus is also threatened with deadly violence. We continue in verses 10 through 11. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. So if the devoted Mary threatened Judas' conscience and the resurrected Lazarus threatened the hostile, Jew, the, the hostile Jewish leaders far much more. Her devotion offered a lasting memorial to the divine glory of Christ, but Lazarus' witness offered a memorial to the divine power of Christ. In fact, as people learned that Jesus had returned to Bethany, they were just as fascinated to see Lazarus as they were to see the Lord. I'm going to go. We're, we're going. Come on, hon. Get the kids. We're going we're, we're, we're to see this guy. He was dead for four days, and now he's alive. And he's over in Bethany. We're going. John wrote, verse 9, Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there in Bethany, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. Lazarus was an unlikely star witness for Jesus as the Messiah. Notice that nothing outstanding about Lazarus is ever recorded in the gospel. In fact, nothing he ever said has been recorded. So what is it about Lazarus that makes his witness so powerful? And the answer isn't found in what Lazarus did for Jesus, it's found in what Jesus did for Lazarus. And the same is true regarding every true Christian. If we were dead in our sins, and if a voice has called out to us, come forth, and if we have been resurrected to spiritual life, and if the master has said to us, loose him and let him go, so that we are now free, then we have become, become undeniable star witnesses for Jesus Christ, just like Lazarus. Now, Lazarus was a threat to the rule of these, later, these leaders who hated Jesus. He was also a threat to this fragile peace that the leaders wanted to maintain with the occupying Romans. And for these reasons, the fact that he had so publicly died and been raised by Jesus, that presented a serious problem for them. J.C. Ryle writes, they could not deny the fact of his having been raised again. Living and moving and eating and drinking within two miles of Jerusalem after lying four days in the grave, Lazarus was a witness to the truth of Christ's Messiahship, whom they could not possibly answer or put to silence. And so like many political figures today, if you don't like what's going on, we're going to cancel you. So we're going to cancel Jesus and we're going to cancel Lazarus because they don't go along with what we believe and they're not doing things the way we think things should be done. And so for this reason, verse 10 says, the chief priest consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. We're going to kill Jesus and we're going to kill Lazarus to get rid of this problem. Matthew Henry, God will have Lazarus to live by a miracle, and they will have him die by malice. Caiaphas had begun by declaring that it would be better for one man to die for the nation, in John eleven fifty, but already he's doubled that. Now there has to be two people to die. Got to cancel Jesus, got to cancel Lazarus. Before the Caiaphases of history are finished, millions of Christ's followers will die for their witness to Jesus. But not one Christian death will effectively stop the spread of the gospel. Never has, and it never will. Christians, we should not be surprised to be threatened in like manner for our Christian witness. Burying the evidence is a tactic 
as ancient as Caiaphas and as modern as the daily newspapers and internet posts. They want to cancel us. They want to get rid of the evidence. But realize that it's only the guilty who take this sort of action. And since Satan wants, above all, to bury or at least obscure the evidence of God's saving power at work in this world, Christians should not only be zealous to give their witness, but should feed their own faith on the proofs of the claims of Christ, both to those in the Bible and those living among us in churches today. So, does your faith in Christ challenge others to think about the gospel? Like Lazarus. Is your godly life a threat to their unbelief? It should be. Are you able to tell people why they should believe on Jesus and that they are able to find convincing proofs of salvation by the way you live? If we continue in the noble line of Mary and Lazarus, we can be certain that others will see the truth of Jesus in our lives and what was said of Lazarus will be said of us too because that by reason of him, many believed on Jesus. The devotion for Jesus that was exemplified by Mary, challenged by Judas, and threatened by the corrupt leaders was richly rewarded by the Lord. One reward of the devotion to Christ is seen in Mary's apparent understanding of his saving mission. In Mark's gospel, Jesus defends Mary's lavish outpouring of this expensive oil by saying this, Mark 14, 8. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the bearing. And Jesus kind of alluded, that here, alluded to that here in John. This shows that Mary, possibly being the only real follower of Christ at this time, understood Jesus' approaching cross and shared in its anticipation of it with him. Only Mary and her knew what was going on, and she's anointing his body ahead of time. Another reward is seen in the experience of Lazarus. Having already experienced a literal resurrection, Lazarus would have been made bold to live a life of strong faith, and he would have been greatly comforted by his personal experience of resurrection when it came for him to die the second time. We talked about this before. Surely, when it came time for Lazarus to die on his deathbed the second time, he eagerly expected his friend Jesus would raise him up to everlasting glory. I often speculate, did Lazarus have a taste of that the first time? If he did, he was probably upset that he got resurrected. He wouldn't want to stay there. So I don't know. We'll have to ask him when we get there. But he knew for a fact, I got resurrected. This is God. I'll be resurrected again. So bring on death. That's a great reward to not be afraid of death. And, 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 the, and the great anticipation that he had. But... I think the main reward of devotion to Christ is seen in one last detail that John gives us from this beautiful section of scripture that we've been studying this morning. He wrote, look at verse 3, that after Mary anointed Jesus' feet and then washed those feet with his, her hair, that she moved around and the house was filled with the odor of of the ointment. Jesus didn't just benefit from this. They all got the benefit from it. Her devotion to Jesus was fragrant, and wherever she went, the aroma of her gift to Jesus was spread because she had had that oil on her hair. And so wherever she's walking, that oil smell is spreading everywhere. What greater reward could we have than this? And what greater blessing could we give to others? 
If we will see Jesus in his divine glory, as we were tempted to do this morning, if we have experienced his grace, and if we will break the bottle of our hearts to pour out in devotion to him, then our lives will bear the fragrance of his salvation, spreading the gospel mercy wherever we go. What a great reward that is. There can be no greater reward than to be used in this way to share the glory of Christ in the world, as we were tempted to do this morning. Knowing that as we pour out our devotion to Christ, he will pour out through us the grace of his gospel for the salvation of those we know and those we love. What a great reward. What a great reward as God uses us in spreading the gospel. And what is the gospel? It's good news. It's fantastic news. The word is euangelion, the gospel. Great news. What is the great news? Starts out with bad news. Bad news, you're a sinner. And there's nothing you can do about it. You are dead in your trespasses and sins. You can't do anything to save yourself. You are a sinner, and all sin has to be punished because God's holy, and you're not. In order for God to remain God, he has to punish sin. In order for him to remain who he is, and he's going to remain who he is. He's just, and he's holy. Every sin has to be punished. Every one of yours, every one of mine. That's the bad news. God's holy, we're not. How do unholy people like us ever get into his presence? We don't unless our sins are paid for. Now, our sins are going to be paid for one way or the other. We're going to pay for them in a Christless eternity called hell for all eternity, or Jesus is going to pay for them on the cross in our stead. One way or the other. And we have the responsibility to repent of our unbelief and believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the kicker, in him alone. And that's hard for sinners to do. I'll trust in Jesus, plus I'll do this. And there are whole religions based upon this. I'll trust in Jesus, plus I'll go to church, plus I'll give in the offering plate, plus I'll go to mass every time, I'll do all the seven sacraments, plus I'll do this, and plus I'll do that, and I'll earn my way some way into heaven. No, you won't, you can't, you're dead. Dead men can't earn a thing. God-given faith must be given to you, and that faith must be in Christ and Christ alone. But if there's faith in Christ and Christ alone, you have the gift of eternal life. Anyone who believes in him has the gift of eternal life. You get resurrection life now, a wonderful, purposeful, meaning life, not meaningful life now, and then when it comes time to you die, as Lazarus did the second time, you will be ushered into this eternal life glorious place called heaven and eventually we'll be on the new heaven and the new earth forever and ever and ever and ever that's good news and that's the good news i share this morning and we call upon you in fact i have the authority to command you to believe on the lord jesus christ and be saved do that we pray lord we thank you for the truths uh, we're all probably sitting here kind of embarrassed that we're not as devoted as Mary was. And we want that. And so we pray that you'll use the message this morning to enhance our devotion, to enhance our, our sacrifices that we're willing to give up, even our own ha happiness if necessary, even our own lives if necessary for the glory of Christ. We have tried, dear God the Father, to exalt your Son and to lift him up and to point people to him and him alone for salvation. And we ask that you would honor that by the saving of souls, by the edification of these, your people. Let them leave here glorying in nothing and in no one but Christ alone. He is our Savior. He is our God. He is our King. He is our friend. We spent time with him this morning. And now we want to bless him. We want to show our devotion to him by the way we live, by the way we talk, by the way we think. Help us to reach that high level. For your glory and for your honor, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.